Welcome to August's Chatting with Charlie. Thanks for joining us after our summer break. We have the WR crew with a legal disclaimer that our program here does not constitute legal advice. This is for informational purposes only. If you do have legal questions, do reach out to the WR immigration team. We'd love to talk further and answer your questions. Today, we've got a new face to our Chatting with Charlie program, uh, Bernie Wolsdorf, and he'll introduce himself. We also, of course, have Charlie Oppenheim on our Chatting with Charlie program, and I'm Laura Blanares. I'm a senior associate with WR Immigration in our Santa Monica office. I specialize in employment-based immigration, and I help companies develop maintain and defend their corporate immigration programs. My clients range from startups to Fortune 100 companies in all sorts of industries like finance, engineering, manufacturing, biotech, and healthcare. Bernie, why don't you introduce yourself? Laura, thank you so much. And thank you for putting uh, the PowerPoint together with our esteemed guest, Charlie Oppenheim. And now I have to say it's Charlie Oppenheim, not Oppenheimer. Charlie was director of visa control for the United States Department of State for 23 years until his recent retirement. And Charlie became much loved by both immigrants and immigration lawyers and the government because, quite frankly, he was the only one who really understood the very complicated visa allocation system. Charlie, I want to shoot a few questions to you as part of the intro. So during the time that you were director of visa control, approximately how many immigrant visas that were subject to numerical control uh, did you issue during your tenure, 23 year tenure? Approximately how many uh, total green cards were issued under your authority, sir? Uh, while I was chief, over 9 million green cards were issued to immigrants on a worldwide basis based on the information published in the monthly visa bulletins. Wow. And I'd love to say that, you know, those 9 million immigrants and their children and families um, have made an amazing contribution to the United States. I note, for example, that over 50 percent of CEOs uh, in Silicon Valley, I don't know if this statistic is accurate, but 50% uh, of CEOs are either immigrants or the children of immigrants of the Fortune 500. I do believe it's accurate. So, Charlie, you led in many of the best and brightest, and obviously uh, the role that you play is absolutely critical. When it comes to introducing myself, um, yeah, what do I say? I'm an immigrant, but uh, so one of those fortunate um Beneficiaries, the only thing is it was more than 23 years ago, so it would have been your predecessor to blame for that one. The thing I talk about myself is um, I'm the former AILA president, I have the privilege of being managing partner of WR Immigration, uh, a firm now uh, with approximately 200 employees, nine offices. But back to you, Laura. Um, I'll be giving the commentary. Laura will be giving you the facts supported by Charlie. So I'm the entertainment today. By the way, um, I don't know if we're going to have an open chat or we have time for questions, but I do want to mention two or three things. One is when you register, you have the opportunity to ask questions and we encourage them, number one. Uh, number two, this webinar will be posted on YouTube. Uh, and maybe beyond. So just search Chatting with Charlie. You'll see all of them come up. Number three, we do two Chatting with Charlie series. Uh, this is the general one, and the focus really is employment-based one, two, and three. But because some of our audience want to find out about four and five and family immigration, uh, I will be touching on those topics briefly. But again, I'm so sorry, folks. This firm of ours, WR Immigration. We do do family immigration. Primary focus is employment immigration. And that's the reason we are focused directly on those categories. But we will comment on the other categories. The general comment is they move very slowly. But um, that's the focus of this particular webinar. There are other webinars that focus on other topics. The 
Chatting with Charlie EB5 program will be on uh, August the 30th at 11 a.m. So if you are wealthy, if you've just won the uh, California lottery or the whatever it is, or you've got a wealthy benefactor or parent who's ready to donate 800000 Yes, you heard me correctly, almost a million dollars. Uh, you can get a green card through investment. That program's actually really popular. We do a separate program. Uh, that one will be on the 30th. So uh, those of you who have rich friends or just won the lottery uh, and need a green card, um, please uh, consider registering for that. Back to you, Laura. So again, this is presented by WR Immigration, and we are here to support our clients, foreign nationals, on their journey forward. So if you have questions in light of today's program, if something sparked your interest, don't hesitate to reach out to me and the WR Immigration team to support your needs. So today we're going to be covering a ton of, you know, this fiscal year. Uh, we're going to ask Charlie all about what's happened in the employment-based space and the family-based space in this fiscal year. And we're also going to ask him about what's to come. And we're going to analyze not only what's to come, but how to plan ahead. Uh, we're going to go through historic levels of immigration. We're going to talk about the chart A and chart B. And, you know, we covered this a little bit in previous sessions or previous chatting with Charlie's about um, why we saw so much forward movement in the last couple of years and what the return to pre-COVID immigration levels will look like. We'll talk a little bit about the diversity visa lottery, how folks take advantage of that, what that looks like, and what the numbers were from this year. We'll also cover how to manage an immigration-friendly corporate immigration program. For our corporate clients, we want to help them understand how to plan for their foreign national employees, as well as how to attract and maintain the best and brightest in foreign national talent. So with that, let's dive right in to the employment-based final action trends here. Thank you. Um, and um, I really appreciate uh, you folks putting together these charts. Um, Charlie, can you explain to us what we have here and what is the significance of this final action date trend in the employment EB1, 2, and 3. Before we answer EB1, of course, extraordinary ability. Uh, EB1B, outstanding professor researcher. EB1C, managerial transfer. EB2, NIW, and PERM, second preference, plus EB3, which is um, the employment professional category that we're talking about here, uh, we're not talking about the EB3 other worker less than 10,000. So, um, Charlie, what are we looking at? What do you see? Uh, gaze into that crystal ball, um, shake the tea leaves, and tell us what you see here, sir. Sure. Uh, I will start off with the employment first preference. And you will notice uh, October through July, the C is listed. That means Think, uh, the category was current, numbers were immediately available for any applicant who had an approved petition. Then starting with August, then September, there is a date listed. But uh, that really isn't a huge concern for people because if you notice for August, the date was August of 2023. And even for September, it is August of 2023. So for all intents and purposes, EB1 is still current for all uh, rest of world applicants, applicants other than those from China and India. And I think that this will continue as we go into the next fiscal year, that uh, the date may lag one or two months behind the actual calendar date. That will give the State Department time to determine if demand is going to increase or if they can uh, continue to leave uh, numbers open. But again, for all intents and purposes, the employment first is current for all rest of world countries. 
which is a good sign. By, by rest of world, uh, we need to define that category. We're talking about other than China and India, and China and India, of course, uh, do uh, constitute the majority of visa applicants. So, yep, that's great. If you are not born in China or India, nor uh, are you married to somebody who is born in other than India or China. So you are subject to the China or India category. If you are born in that country, we don't care what passport you've got. But if you have a good faith marriage to an individual who is not born in those countries, who is applying together with you uh, for a green card, then you can cross charge out of India or China. But uh, Charlie, so generally the news is quite good for the rest of the world, folks, uh, but not as good for India and China. We will dive deeper into that under the EB1 category. This is the best and the brightest. Yep. You're a senior manager. Yep. You're an outstanding professor researcher with three years of experience. Yep. You are extraordinary in art, science, business, education, or athletics. You've got an Olympic medal and you were nominated for the Nobel Prize. Did not win, but we're going to sign you up anyway. Even with your silver medal in the Olympics, we're going to take you on as a client and get you a green card in all probability under EB1. Uh, Charlie, let's go EB2. Um, one of the things about EB1A, extraordinary ability, is you can self-petition. You do have to prospectively benefit the United States, but you can self-petition. You do not need the employer. You can have an employer, but you can self-petition. So that category is very popular, but very few people qualify, quite frankly, because uh, you really have to be the top of the top. But Charlie, let's talk EB2. EB2 bachelor's degree plus five years of progressive work experience or U.S. master's degree. You can potentially qualify for EB2. I know that a lot of the perms you file, Laura, almost on a daily basis qualify for EB2. I think that's the majority of your perm work. Um, but that also has a self-sponsored category, the NIW. So we've seen a surge of EB2. So Charlie, tell me, what are we seeing here for other than China and India in regard to what happened in FY23 that ends next month? Just for those of you who don't know, fiscal year 24 starts in just over 30 days, October 1. The visa bulletin comes out a, a year ahead. What are we seeing here under EB2? I'm not sure I like what I see. Well, EB2 is an interesting issue. Uh, in earlier years, there were often unused employment first preference numbers. And if there were unused first preference numbers, they could fall down and be added to the employment second preference limit. That is not occurring this year. And that is required that effective in December, the State Department imposed a final action date for work, rest of world countries other than China and India for EB2. Uh, that date held for a period of time uh, toward the end of the year, starting in April. They started running out of numbers. Uh, so they had to retrogress the date, make an earlier date to limit future number use then for August and September, their estimates of uh, number use went down. So they were slowly starting to advance the date, which is a very positive sign that there will be recovery in the rest of world employment second preference date. I think that there's a good chance that that date will advance for the month of October. And I think that it could advance to at least November of uh, 2022. Uh, so I think, again, it is positive, the August and September movement, and I think it will move again for October, and we'll have to see from there. So Charlie, what you are predicting and what you see in the tea leaves um, is that uh, other than China, so ROW, rest of the world, other than China and India, EB2 category, this is super important, folks, for a lot of people with NIWs, 
um, and Laura's perm clients, um, we are looking at a weight of, and I know you can't answer this question, a weight of uh, one and a half years to two years before we can file an adjustment. Is that what we're saying? If you're not from India or China, uh, you expect some forward movement, but this is this is unusual to see two, three retrogressions in one year. That, this shows a problem, right, Charlie? Yeah, it, it shows that uh, maybe uh, when they were making their estimates, their estimates uh, were not as accurate as they had been in the past. Uh, and there could have been any number of reasons for that. Uh, processing from the Department of Labor, various processing, could have uh, kind of thrown a monkey wrench into the, their projections and applicants coming forward. Applicants may have moved their case from employment third preference. If they've been waiting a, a long time in employment third, they could potentially have upgraded their case to employment second at some point during fiscal 2023. Again, uh, I think that there will be an employment second preference final action date for rest of world applicants for the foreseeable future until uh, there is a somewhat decline in demand. But I would not expect that to be anytime well, soon. The good years are over. Uh, EB2 has been current for a few years for rest of the world. That's historical. So it's not only Chinese and Indian, although we can't really compare the rest of the world to the Chinese and Indians. Personally, I find it absurd, the 7% per country allocation. Uh, countries like India with 2 billion people get the same allocation as Belgium. Uh, doesn't make sense. The backlogs for you know this rest of world and the EB2, for our corporate clients who are sponsoring foreign nationals through EB2 PERM, practically we're not seeing PERMs approved for a year. So Good point. Uh, you know, as, as far as the priority date backlogs, it's honestly not really impacting the speed in which someone Got can it. file their, their adjustment of status application because they're pending PERM for over a year. So folks that have priority dates of July 1st, 2022, maybe just got their PERM approved if they're lucky. Got so it. Um, they're not seeing, practically yeah. they're not seeing the impact. So basically you call them up with the good news. Great, your PERM just got approved. And by the way, we can go ahead and file your adjustment if you're lawfully in the US. So this is not a big problem, uh, provided you were not born in India or China or married to somebody, uh, if you were born, married to somebody who is not born in India or China. So that's good news. Thanks for pointing that out, Laura. So let's jump over to the EB3 category. This is either bachelor's degree, professional category, or at least two years of work experience in a job that requires two years of work experience, so-called SVP-7, at least. We were current, Charlie, for literally years under EB-3, which was wonderful. Let's call it the COVID years. Third preference being current, and we've now got not a bad backlog, a horrible backlog. For August and September, we went all the way back to 2020. Yikes. That's longer than your perms are taking. So now, Laura, when your perms get approved, you've got to tell these people, hey, so sorry. You've got at least another one or two years to wait, even though you're not born in India or China. Charlie, what are we predicting in October for EB3 uh, professional category? The reason for, one, the implementation of a date in May was they, they saw that they were starting to run out of numbers and they imposed a date to try to limit future number use. The date they imposed did not work. They had to retrogress it for July and August and held for September. Uh, effectively, the May 1st date, they had basically run out of numbers. And so that May 1st date effectively means that they weren't going to be using many, if any, numbers at all. Uh, so I believe that for October, the start of the new fiscal year, they will have a new supply of numbers. And it, it was always my policy 
that come October, I had my new su full supply of numbers. I would try to do a full recovery of any retrogressions, if at all possible. If it wasn't possible, I would try to recover as much as possible. I think for the rest of the world, third preference date for October will return to at least June 1st of 2022. Oh, wow. Uh, That's good news. Um... Charlie, that is very optimistic news. And if accurate, that means that uh, Laura's perm approvals are going to be very, very happy. Um, that is, sorry, I have to keep saying other than India or China, um, that that you'll be able to file adjustments for these folks. Uh, Laura, maybe you got to start telling your HR people to start gearing up. Um, when the visa bulletin comes out in September, uh, middle of September, this next chatting with Charlie is going to be critical because now we're not going to be speculating. We're actually going to be telling you exactly. Uh, the good news is that Charlie is predicting a recovery of EB3 in October. For so those of you who got depressed or at least some sadness, Charlie is telling us that no, there's retrogression, but maybe that's just an adjustment and that come October 1, other than China, ROW uh, will potentially recover. And this is the final action date. Charlie, we're talking primarily about chart A final action date, which is the basis for visa issuance, as opposed to chart B date for filing or application filing date, which is get ready. Um, traditionally, USCIS will open chart B for AOS adjustment filings for a month or two in October and November. They haven't always done that, but it's it's more common than not. Uh, do you have any insight on chart B filings uh, come October uh, and what you would expect them to do with regard to changing the cutoff date for chart B to allow those people in the US in lawful status to file AOS? Uh, typically, I would coordinate with USCIS in late October, the first couple days of September, to determine what the application filing dates would be for the October visa bulletin. And typically, those would be the dates we would expect the final action dates to reach in the next eight to 12 months. Uh, I think his Typically, immigration in recent years has been allowing those dates to be used uh, through about January to March, but I wouldn't hold that for this coming year because of the lower annual limits. So I think that every, anybody that was eligible in October to file based on the application filing dates, if immigration says that chart B can be used, you should be able, you should be ready to act quickly and file your adjustment of status application as quickly as possible in October and November if the uh, dates are left open for the immigration or by USCIS. Very helpful. Thank you, Charlie. So we're talking worldwide um, chargeability here. By the way, we have a few questions. Um, we also have questions. We encourage people when you register to actually submit your questions at that point um, because we've got a lot of material today. I will try and answer the questions at the end, but we do also want to keep within an hour. So um, if your question doesn't get answered today, um, feel free to um, ask that same question in the next uh, registration, and uh, we will attempt to get to all of your answers. So let's move to the next slide and talk about China. What I love to tell everybody is talk to your congressman. And I know that tech alliances and many have tried to find a solution. For me, the solution is not to take away the green cards from every other category and increase the suffering. I know this is not a popular statement, but the solution is for Congress to increase the numbers. It's been 33 years. So boo to you, Congress for not doing your job in increasing the number of immigrant visas available 
to in this category, we're looking at best and brightest. We're looking at categories of people who are not taking U.S. jobs. When Laura says she got a perm approval, that is a certification from the United States Department of Labor that there is no U.S. worker available for that job. So why are you making these people suffer? All right, Charlie, what are we seeing for China? And um, yeah, not so good is what I can see. Uh, EB1, not too bad, but very few people qualify. What do you see here on EB2 and 3 for all these smart young Chinese? It's, uh, it's important to note that as long as there is a rest of world final action date listed, both the China and India will also have a date and it will lag far behind the rest of world date. So I believe that for the foreseeable future, there will be a China EB1 final action date. I think that the date is likely to hold for the month of October, February 1st of 2022, possibly move to uh, February 15th of 2022. But I do not expect any major movement of the China first preference date. I think that state will uh, kind of wait and see what the demand is. And they, they know that there is enough demand that they can hold it for a while and then move it and still be able to easily use all the required numbers. That is not... Uh... Good news. I just wanted to emphasize, I'm sure everybody understood, but but basically what you're saying is because there's no ROW, because of the rest of the world being backlogged, there's no leftovers to share with China. And that means that the China and India numbers will continue to move at a snail's pace. Please don't shoot the messenger here, but that's not good news, correct? Correct. It typically... The employment first preference, uh, there are thousands and thousands uh, of unused rest of world numbers which can be made available for use by Chinese and Indian applicants. That is not going to happen for the foreseeable future uh, and it will not happen. Uh, they will be subject strictly to their per country limit until the rest of world date is once again listed as current. And I don't see that in the near future. Charlie, it may occur, but not in the near future. Charlie, strategic question here. Uh, we have this somewhat absurdity that EB3 is actually slightly better than EB2. EB2, um, the master's degree category is actually more backlogged than EB3. Does that make sense for me to try and jump out of the EB2 line into the EB3 line? This is what happens to me when I'm checking out at the supermarket. The line next to me is much shorter. So I leave that line and I jump to the short line. And then suddenly that short line always freezes up. Every time I go in it, there's a little old man like me standing in line who can't find his credit card. And gosh, I wish I'd stayed in the old line. What's your advice here? Do I jump from EB2 to EB3 to a lower category? Is that going to improve my waiting line? It's a, a personal pref uh, preference. And I think you really need to speak with your legal representative to get all the facts. Uh, often, often people will start jumping line and we would see people in the EB3 upgrade their status to EB2, as you said. But then that would put demand on the EB-2, and then that date would be worse than the EB-3. So it's kind of... Uh, it's, Much of a muchness. It, yeah, it's really something I would not hazard a, a guess. And it also takes considerable amount of time in most cases, because the Immigration Service is going to have to look at your upgrade and see if, yes, you do qualify. And that could take months and months and in the meantime, the EB2 date may have advanced. But I have talked to and suggested while I was chief that if an applicant was entitled to EB3 or EB2 status and they could be uh, qualified and counted in EB3 or EB2, if the, either category that they were eligible and whichever one came due first, they would get processed there. 
It but that hasn't happen. happened. It has not happened. No. Laura, does that present legal issues for you as an attorney doing the perm? Yesterday, there was a requirement for a master's degree uh, for this job. Now there's uh, only a requirement for a bachelor's degree. Does that present legal issues for you as a perm lawyer? How do you structure that? Uh, is that a different job uh, opportunity? Does that create conflict for you? So when someone, you're talking about when someone downgrades from Downgrade, EB2 to EB3. Yeah. Yeah, In yeah, this absurd happens. situation for India and China, EB3 is actually better than EB2, slightly. The, yeah. Practically, when someone's doing that, and we filed a ton of these in 2021, someone's doing this um, on, on the I-140. So they're just asking for a new approval in the EB-3 category. Uh, ideally, you're doing this to then immediately file an adjustment of status if you have the opportunity to concurrently file the adjustment of status and you're eligible. So there's eligibility criteria we would need to review um, that the job offer is still the same with the company. We could then move forward with the filing. And in those instances, we would recommend it. Again, you'd want to have counsel review your qualifying criteria, meaning that the job offer is still the same to do the downgrade. So to Bernie, your question, it's not really about changing the minimum requirements. It's really just filing a new I-140, which again, the company that um, has your underlying perm has to support, um, and it's not redeclaring any minimum requirements. Got it. I've had cases before where a client, a foreign national, moves from an EB2 job uh, with one company to an EB3 job um, at another company, and that's not problematic because it's based on the minimum requirements for the job. Not, but they can the carry their criteria. priority dates. That's the good part. Is they that carry with their priority employment date. EB1, 2, and 3, they carry their priority dates. You cannot carry your priority date from EB1, 2, and 3 to EB4 or 5 or vice versa, but you can carry them between EB1, 2, and 3. So that's really important. You can shuffle these categories. I often advise people to file your EB2 national interest waiver, get an approval if you're from India or China, and then maybe one day you'll be able to upgrade to EB1 when you, you know, win your Nobel Prize. So um, getting your place in line makes a lot of sense. Charlie's reminding me that we are running out of time and that I talk too much was his personal comment. Uh, no, it wasn't, but it's true. Um, would you move uh, the slides? Let's start going. India, what do we see? Really quickly, this is depressing, but it's actually it's tragic. Um, yeah. Charlie, what are your observations here? Because this is what I call the sad truth. India, again, India in past years has been dependent upon the rest of world unused numbers to be made available. That is not going to happen uh, as long as there's a rest of world date. I think that for October, there is a good chance that the India employment first preference date may move, advance to June 1st of 2021. If that were to happen, I would not be surprised if it was held for a period of time while they see the impact of that. But again, the India Employment First Preference will be subject to a final action date for the foreseeable future. So that's even our best and brightest Indians uh, stuck in a horrible waiting line. Basically, what you're telling me is either they marry an, Amer an American citizen and get exempt from the category or they uh, win the lottery and they have a million dollars and do EB-5 because that's the only open category for a super smart uh, Indian national. Uh, your PhDs and your 1000 Google citation uh, scholar score is not going to save you uh, because the categories are backlogged. But Charlie, you're saying you do see some improvement. Uh, EB2, terrible. EB3, disastrous. The only solution here is Congress, do the right thing, please. Respect the incredibly valuable role um, that immigrants from India and China play. Charlie, any other comment on this disastrous, sad, I, and depressing news? Yes, again, uh because the rest of the world has a date, there are no, uh, quote, otherwise unused numbers which can be made available to India. Therefore, India is going to have a uh, slow movement and continue to have a date. But I do think for October, there is an excellent chance that the India employment second date 
could return to at least July 1st of 2011. Again, it may hold there, but I think that there is an excellent chance for it to, to advance to at least July 1st of 2011. Uh, mm -hmm. With the employment third for uh, India, the reason for the 2009 date, again, they basically did that date to shut off any India third preference number use for August and September. Uh, but I, there again, I think that there is an excellent chance that the India third date could recover to as much as April 1st of 2012. Again, my policy was to try to do as much of a recovery for October and recover ground lost in the previous fiscal year, if at all possible, because I always knew that there were applicants who were stuck in limbo during that time because of the retrogression. So Charlie, yeah. what are we seeing here on family-based final action? A uh, quick summary, F1, um, sorry if this is not accurate, but F1, uh, children under 21 uh, with US citizen parent, F2A parent or spouse of a permanent resident, sp spouse or child of permanent resident, that category is a little bit better. F2Bs, this is adult children of permanent residents. F3 married, children of citizens, terrible category. F4 sibling category, please don't call me. I may not live long enough to finish your case. Uh, under F4. So Charlie, what are we seeing briefly under final action date trends for all family categories? If you could summarize what you what we're seeing here in terms of waiting lines. This is all chargeability. This is not India, Philippines or Mexico. This is the rest of the world categories. What are you seeing for uh, other than one note? Uh, these dates would apply to China, all China family categories and they would apply to the India family first through third preference uh, dates. But again, I think that these dates, these positive, you notice the orange uh, arrows showing movement. I think this indicates that over 95% of the, the family-based numbers are used at overseas posts. During the COVID times, the, many of the overseas posts had limited processing capacity. And I think during the latter part of fiscal 2022 and throughout 2023, the State Department was making a concerted effort to uh, address their backlog in the family categories and anything they had in employment. So I think that there will be start to be some forward movement in the rest of world final action dates for the uh, family dates. So I think that you can expect positive movement uh, even in the F2B, I think that the fact that the F2B has held for the entire year, that that demand should have been addressed. And therefore, uh, at some time, hopefully in the early part of fiscal 2024, we may begin to see some F2B forward movement as well. But those adult children of permanent residents are very sad and separated. Uh, a lot of them on F visas and getting gray hair like me. But uh, these are terrible. Again, Charlie, help us with this. The annual well, basic allocation for family is 220,000 annually it's, and it's, uh, for employment about 140. Correct me on those numbers, sir. Yeah, it's 226,000 for family and a minimum of 140,000 for employment plus any unused family from the previous year. Uh, and I'll give you an example of how bad the situation you you mentioned the family fourth preference, which is brothers and sisters of U.S. citizens. That annual limit is 65,000 numbers. There are more than two million applicants waiting yeah, I, in that line for visas. So well, over two million versus a limit of 65,000. You can see why the date is lagging so far behind. Uh, so the family, as bad as the employment dates are, the family dates are much, much worse. Which is why, you know, folks, these numbers are terrible. These numbers move like snails. Um, you know, shoot the messenger here, but we're not the people who control these numbers. It is terrible. It is disgusting. Talk to your congressman. Fix these things. 
the basis of the 1952 Act is family reunification. This is not family reunification. So Congress, do the right thing, fix these things. What are you seeing? Uh, China, very quickly, uh, take a picture of this one. We will be posting this online. These are substantially similar to the rest of the world for China. So China's not as bad as the other categories. Is this correct, Charlie? Yeah, all of these China dates are the same as worldwide. Uh, the India first through third are the same. The fourth preference, India, is earlier than the rest of world date. I would expect the India fourth preference date to start advancing at some point during uh, oh. fiscal 2024, again, because it has been held for the entire year. They should have been were able to be working off the backlog. And uh, But it's a 20-year wait, so we're going to move on to the next uh, slide, Laura. Mexico, this, well, if you thought that one was bad, just look at this one. This yeah. is uh, beyond shocking, uh, is all I can say. I'm so sorry for the people stuck in these horrible waiting lines, including the F2A. This is minor children and spouses of permanent residents. Come on, they should be allowed to live together. We need to parole these kids in, uh, but let's move to the next slide because I'm running out of time. Philippines, you thought the other one was bad. Nothing is worse than the Philippine waiting lines under family. I'm so sorry for my Filipino friends. Uh, terrible, terrible. Next slide, please. All right. So, Charlie, this is good news. You're basically saying that F2A you expect to see recovering. What are your other observations, sir? Again, as this says, I think that the we will see, start to see forward movement in the rest of world family dates. It may be slow, but there will be some uh, some movement in them uh, in the coming months. Let's move to the next slide, which is fiscal. We've already commented on a lot of this, but Charlie, in as much as we have not commented, please tell us what you expect to see October 124, the beginning of the new fiscal year. Normally, Charlie would provide a allocation, but this year, uh, we have this problem of returning to pre-COVID levels. No more uh, 295,000 allocation. We're back to the lower numbers. But give us some good news if there's any here, sir. Uh, well, I think it is important to note that uh, the family categories, as I mentioned, the will some forward movement. The limit is 226, 226,000 for the employment categories. The current year's employment limit is 197,000 for fiscal 24. It will be down to approximately 150,000, possibly plus or minus 5,000. So we're having effectively a 25% reduction in the employment limit for fiscal 2024. People that have been seeing positive movements, particularly in fiscal 2022, uh, they should expect slower movements of the employment dates throughout fiscal 2024. Again, a much lower annual limit. Uh, China, both China and India, it will be subject to their per country limits in the employment first, second, and third, as long as there is a rest of world final action date listed for those categories. In India, employment second, particularly, has in the past been dependent on having extra numbers. Uh, I would advise applicants, if the Immigration Service says that chart B can be used for uh, the application filing dates for the months of October and November, file as quickly as possible. Do not delay because there is no guarantee that those will be allowed to be used for long periods of time by the Immigration Service. So act quickly. Thank you, Charlie. Where can you even buy that kind of advice? Uh, you can't. No money will purchase that. Only Charlie Oppenheim is able to make these predictions and provide these this advice. Let's move on. Um, I like to talk about diversity. Um, unfortunately, please note, China, India, and all the other countries that provide most of the immigrants to the U.S., you are penalized because uh, you come from a country where there are 
so-called high immigration levels. So this is to create some diversity. I was born in Africa. Africa is the big winner on this one uh, because uh, we Africans provide the least number of immigrants to the U.S. So this is a program to correct the imbalance or so-called imbalance. I'm not going to get into the politics other than to say that 142,947 winners, registrants were notified of whom only 55,000 will get, get green cards. Everybody always tells me, oh, lottery is so easy. It is true. If you're qualified and if you do everything correctly, you do not need a lawyer to apply for lottery. But if you win, you may want to consider having expert counsel. Not one of those people on the Internet who claim to be expert, but a board certified immigration specialist who understands this program. Because when you win the lottery, you do not win. You merely get a ticket, which will give you a 38.4 percent chance of winning. And that's where you need counsel to make sure that you are documentarily qualified. People goof this up every year. And this is what I call a Cinderella visa. If your visa is not issued by September 30th of the end of the year. So those of you who won last year, you've got just over 30 days to complete your case or poof, you will not get a green card. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so we're down to our questions. I like to uh, answer all the questions we've got. We've got quite a few online. Uh, I'm going to take those questions that uh, we were given. We've probably answered most of them. Can I leave the U.S. after filing Form 485 while on an H-1B visa and re-enter without getting an AP? The answer is yes, provided you have an H-1B visa stamp in your passport. H-1B is a dual intent. There are only two types of visas which have full dual intent. That's H-1B and L-1. And if you have the visa stamp in your passport, after filing and getting the receipt of your 485, if you have a valid H-1B and you are working for that employer, you can use that H-1B to enter and you can even flip over to an EAD, but that's a one-hour topic. Can a green card holder apply for some type of immigration for their spouse? Well, yes, that was the F-2A category. And we were lamenting, so go back to the slide, look at the F2A, that is the um, family second preference. But if you, the green card holder, become a U.S. citizen, your spouse can qualify as an immediate relative with no waiting line. But F2A under chart B has been open, thank the good Lord, um, and hopefully will remain so. On its employment-based FAQ page, U.S. says the final aid dates established in the visa bulletin reflect the annual and per country limits. However, DOS says it divides visas into monthly allocation. How are final action dates set? Charlie, that's a complicated question. Can you give me a one-sentence answer? There's the annual limit in the State Department attempts to make use of a certain amount of numbers on a monthly basis to allow the annual limit to be reached. They adjust their targets on a monthly basis. The easiest way is think of this as your annual uh, family budget. Your boss gives you uh, your entire pay for the year on October 1st, and you have until September 30th to use it, and you have to divvy it up among the months to address all of your bills throughout the year and make adjustments to your budgets. Wonderful explanation. Thank you. We've answered the next question. What do we expect for EB1 and FY 2024? Some level of recovery. How much forward movement do you expect for final action date for EB2 rest of the world? We addressed that in our slide. Why has F2A remained current uh, in chart B through retrogressed in final action by more than six years? I think we touched on that. Do you want to clarify that? Uh, basically, they retrogressed the date to shut off number use for the uh, at the end of the year because they were reaching the 2A annual limit. Uh, they will return uh, for the month of October, and they want to allow people to continue to file on a current basis in Chart B. They think that there may be numbers available in 2024. 
very helpful. Thank you. And remember, Charlie Oppenheimer is the only person, in my opinion, qualified to answer most of these questions. So please encourage your friends to listen. Uh, human resources, share this with your other re human resource partners. Uh, reach out to Laura. Reach out to me. Uh, register for next uh, month's Chatting with Charlie. And if you are very rich uh, or have a rich uh, benefactor, a register for the EB5 program on the 30th. So let's see if there's any questions here which have not been answered uh, in the chat column. Why USCIS stop publishing 485 pending inventory data by country priority date and classification? Yeah, I didn't even notice that. Uh, how mean of them. Um, what you could do is file a Freedom of Information Act uh, request and then they will collect the data. They used to publish that. I don't know why. Um, Charlie is Department of State, so he can't really speak for them. Uh, my PD is July 2016 F2B and I'm already documentary qualified. F2B has not moved. So when can I expect an interview? How long? Charlie, do you have a crystal ball for India F2B? 2016 July what would you say wild guess I think that they would by the end of the fiscal year they should have a good chance I think that the 2B date has a potential to move to October 1st of 2015 for uh, October but I, I think that they should be safe by the end of fiscal 2024 Yay, yay. I love giving good news. Um, thank you. Question. This is a good one. 56 senators have asked that uh, we do what I call, uh, Charlie, help me with the date, August 2017 Visa Gate. Uh, when did you open up all the visa categories? Uh, it was for the month of July 2007. I made all of the employment categories current. And, and uh, then that allowed everybody with an approved petition it, could file uh there has been some suggestion to do so again it, it would not it's not going to happen uh the basis for doing it in 2007 the information provided to me uh indicated that the no, amount of numbers remaining for use in the employment category exceeded the amount of eligible demand Therefore, I made the categories current. A final Charlie, action. Bless you. Your place in heaven is guaranteed. 250,000 adjustments were filed during that six week period. I had no sleep for six weeks and I still haven't recovered, but we are very grateful for what you did. Uh, will they do it? Um, Charlie, I know that Congress used to uh, lean on you, the White House used to lean on you. Uh, I suspect, I'm not going to ask you to answer, that you still provide uh, unofficial guidance uh, to some of the colleagues uh, on the Hill. But uh, the sad truth is, I don't personally think that with an election year, uh, this is going to happen. I would love if it did. It needs to be done. So, folks, we are out of time. I want to respect all of your time. Those of you who did not get your question answer, thank you for the lovely comment, uh, Marianne. We do need to talk to Congress. Call your congressman. Google right now a search for how to reach my congressman. Type in your zip code. Um, if you are a U.S. citizen, uh, please write. Encourage your friends. We need to fix these waiting lines. That is obvious. This is not right. We are making Nobel Prize winners wait, Olympic medalists wait. Really, this makes no sense. Remember, everybody, these are the people who are following the legal system. People say we don't want illegal aliens. We don't want people crossing the border. We want everybody to follow the rules. Yep. I'm an American. I don't like people who drive over the speed limit. I don't like people who drive drunk. But these are the people who follow the law, and many of them are getting the short end of the stick. This is not right. Congress, do your job. I wish you all a pleasant rest of the summer. Um, share this with your friends. Join us, rich people, uh, for the uh, August 30th. And uh, make sure you don't miss the September chatting with Charlie uh, we will probably have Sharina back, so no more of my bad jokes. 
Uh, you're out of luck, folks. No more bad jokes. I know you're laughing with me, not at me. But uh, nevertheless, it's been wonderful uh, speaking with you today. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Laura. And thank you for the back end team for all their wonderful work. Love the new graphics and can't wait to uh, watch the next one. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody. This is Bernie Wolfstow from WR Immigration. Call 1-800-VISA-LAW. That actually is our telephone number, 1-800-VISA-LAW from within the United States or Canada, or email us at visalaw at Wolfstow. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's been a true pleasure and joy to speak with you. I wish I had more positive news, but um, I think we learned a lot today. At least I did. Hope you did too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.